Thousand Year Door has a relatively simple battle system on the surface. Mario gets to choose between his standard attacks, items, special moves, and a handful of other options, his partner gets to do the same, and then the enemy gets a chance to attack or use an item. But hidden within this simple cycle of silly little paper guys doing paper things are a ridiculous amount of small mechanics and nuances that people are still discovering to this day. I've played this game dozens of times throughout my life, and obviously I've sunk quite a lot of time into this game over the last several months doing all these different challenges and mod playthroughs and everything, and pretty much every time I still manage to learn something new about the way this game works. So instead of tackling a challenge this week, I decided it would be fun to compile a bunch of these weird and interesting mechanics into a single video. Some of them are things I've mentioned in passing in previous videos, others are things I've learned from other players, and some are things I've learned by trial and error throughout many years of playing this game. This isn't a ranking or anything like that, but for the sake of being organized, I'll split this video up into different categories of mechanics. I'm not really going to be covering glitches in this video either, this is going to be more so about hidden behaviors or minor mistakes within the game that don't break sequences or exploit huge gaps in the game's code. There is absolutely no way I'm going to get every possible thing in one video, so if there's any obscure mechanics you know about this game that I don't end up covering, make sure to let me know down below and maybe there will be a follow-up video. And speaking of follow-up videos, make sure you get subscribed if you like this one so that you see future Paper Mario content from this channel. Anyways, let's get started. Let's ease into this one with some simple ones that most fans of Thousand Year Door probably already know. The US version of the game allows you to guard and super guard most attacks in the game with only four exceptions. The most well known one is the bite attack from Hooktail, Gloomtail, and Bonetail. This attack will always hit the front character and can only have its damage reduced by defense increasing badges or buffs. I'm not sure if anybody has ever figured out exactly why this attack can't be guarded, but if I were to take a shot in the dark guess, I would think that it's due to how the Hooktail tail cutscene plays out where she tricks you into getting attacked? Maybe this behavior was programmed for this interaction where they wanted to lock your inputs and then they just copied it for the other dragons? I'm not really sure. Marilyn's Lightning is the second unguardable attack you encounter in the game, and this one can actually be pretty threatening when she charges up before using it. In the Chapter 8 fight against the Shadow Sirens, she can charge and then deal 14 damage to each of your characters that not only can't be blocked, but also pierces defense. I don't really have a good guess as to why this one isn't guardable, as many similar attacks in the US version are. Maybe it's because it shares properties with the Thunder Rage item, which is unblockable like every other item in the game, but that might be a bit of a stretch. The third attack that can't be guarded is the Bulky bob Explosion move, which is also shared by the bob later. This one personally makes total sense to me. The entire point of these guys is to kill them before they can blow up, so if you could block their big charged up attack, they would be even weaker than they already are. The only other attack in the game that can't be super guarded is when Shadow Queen's dead hands pull your character underground and do horrible, unspeakable things to them. Interestingly enough, it actually can be regular guarded, which makes it the only attack in the game that can be guarded, but not super guarded. I'm guessing the reason for this one is that all of the Shadow Queen's attacks are unsuper guardable in the Japanese version, and that this was just an oversight that wasn't changed in the US version. Okay, so this is why I said at the beginning of the video that there's no way I'd get everything, because right now I'm literally looking at the super guard wiki page, and apparently there is a fifth attack that can't be super guarded in the game. It's Vivian's fiery jinx attack in the encounter in Boggly Woods, and it's unsuper guardable just like Marilyn's Thunder, but oddly enough, Beldum's Ice Wind still is super guardable. I swear to god this game man. The Japanese version actually has a ton more unsuper guardable attacks across the whole game, but I'm going to continue to focus on the US version to prevent this from becoming a comparison video between different versions of the game. I've played the US version all my life, and I'm guessing the majority of people watching this have too. Another one that I think is slightly obscure but still probably known by quite a few people is that Vivian and Flurry actually have immunities to earthquake type attacks, including the item itself and similar attacks like Gloomdale's stomping ground shake attack. It does make sense because of the fact that they float, but I do find it interesting considering how underused immunities are in this game's battle system. And for some reason, when Vivian is an enemy, she doesn't have this immunity and can be damaged by earthquake items as if she was grounded. And speaking of underused mechanics, how about the stage ceiling? You probably remember this best from either the Rockhawk fight or the Lord Crump fight in Chapter 5, but it also appears against swoopers in these two rooms in Creepy Steeple and nowhere else in the game. Rockhawk actually has the ability to knock 
the ceiling down, dealing damage to himself and both your characters. I hadn't seen this behavior until a recent challenge run since I usually kill him pretty quickly, but maybe that's a thing you've seen before. The ceiling can apparently also fall down when it's present in the swooper fights, which is probably a pretty rare thing for anybody to have ever seen. The ceiling can't fall down during the Lord Crump fight, presumably because he controls it and it's an integral part of the second half of the first phase. Lord Crump's robot in Chapter 7, Magnus Von Grapple 2.0, has a misdirect that I never actually put together until a YouTube comment pointed it out to me. When he vacuums up the crowd through his suspiciously positioned tube, he takes aim at one of your characters and fires. The interesting part is that while it looks like he's aiming and selecting a character to attack, the reality is that he will always target the character in the front slot. It's a weird choice to make him act like he's aiming but not have any randomness behind the decision, but I guess I appreciate it because it makes dealing with that strong ass attack way easier in challenge runs. Grotus also has an obscure behavior that is definitely intentional, but never directly referenced by the game. If you attack his staff with a single target attack, it won't deal any damage to Grotus himself, but it will make his next attack a dud that fails and wastes his turn. He will still spawn Grotus X's after this, so it doesn't completely foil him, but it's still occasionally useful when fighting against him. This is another fact that I would say is pretty well known, but I figured I'd still include it in this video since so many people commented about not knowing it when I mentioned it in a previous video. Another boss quirk that I find really interesting because of how specific it is, is the fact that Hooktail's defense actually behaves dynamically against the Cricket Attack FX badge. If Mario attacks her with a jump, the first hit will have her defense applied to it, but after she hears the cricket, her defense will immediately drop and not apply to the second hit. And then the same is true for the first hit of Power Bounce. All hits after the first will apply without defense. Without a doubt though, the boss quirk that I most wish I knew as a kid would be the fact that Showstopper has a 5% chance to work against Bowser and Kami Koopa. These odds definitely aren't good enough that it's worthwhile to kill both of them with it, but honestly spamming Showstopper until one of them goes down is a pretty entertaining way to play the fight. I honestly can't really put my finger on why exactly it is that these guys are susceptible to it. No other bosses in the Palace of Shadow are, besides Darkbones, who's pretty much a mini-boss at best anyways. Now this next one, I guarantee you do not know unless you're one of the people who's seen this YouTube short from Coop. If there's a Pokey with only his head segment left and you use Gulp on it with Yoshi, there is a 50% chance he will swallow the segment and kill it rather than spitting it back out at the next enemy behind him. This is one of the most insane facts about this game to me because it's such a specific scenario that even the worst of players of the game would probably never find themselves in. To get a Pokey down to just one segment, it either has to use its segment throwing attack three times or it has to be hit with Koops or Super Hammer three times. And due to the fact that neither Either the Pokey or Poison Pokey have that much health, it pretty much has to be that first option there, otherwise this thing will be dead before you get the chance to do this. Yoshi is also just not a great choice of partner to use against these guys anyways because of the whole spiky thing they have going on. To top it all off, there's only a 50% chance that this will even happen if the rest of the scenario is set up perfectly, which makes this so stupid but so cool. I'm genuinely curious how many people have managed to encounter this scenario before without trying to set it up, because it's probably few enough that I could counted on my fingers. I've never even done this myself, I only learned it from that Coop video. Another random Yoshi gulp behavior that I've never heard anybody talk about at all happens against the Shadow Queen. Shadow Peach is able to be attacked by gulp as you would expect, nothing weird happens. But then, on the second phase, you can't attack her true form with gulp, which I think is reasonable considering the size advantage she has against Yoshi. His tongue just harmlessly bounces off of her and your 4 FP is completely wasted. But, during the part of phase 1 where she trans transforms into her true form and is invincible, you can actually gulp her. Yoshi is able to swallow and spit her back out, but the move still deals no damage because she's invincible. I just discovered this one while messing around with random moves during a challenge run, and I've never seen any other references to this. This next one is actually incredibly useful even for casual players. Did you know that special moves completely ignore any sort of evasion buffs or accuracy debuffs? Not only does this mean that they will always hit even when Mario is dizzy or the enemy is dodgy, but this also includes invisible status. Earth Tremor, Clock Out, Art Attack, Showstopper, and Supernova can all target enemies regardless of whether they're invisible or not. This is a super useful option to have whenever the odd boo flies out of the audience and makes a boss invisible at a bad time, or against wizards or boos. And speaking of wizards, there's a few quirks related to them as well. For starters, wizards 
wizards are one of the only enemies in the game that can't be knocked backwards by the super or ultra hammer attacks. You would think since they're floating they would be able to be knocked back, but they randomly have this immunity to make them stronger, I guess? One of my favorite little oversights involving these guys involves the duplication move that they have. Whenever they're the last enemy alive, they'll duplicate into four or five copies of themselves with all but one of them being fake. If the wizard happens to be holding an item, however, after it duplicates, only the real one will be shown holding the item, completely giving him away. The same thing also applies to Magikoopas, who have the exact same duplication ability. And finally, there's the regular wizard, who's kind of a quirk all on his own. He completely lacks the duplication move and the signature tickle move that the other two wizards have. And for some reason, he actually gains a second version of the laser attack, one that doesn't do damage but instead has a 50% chance to confuse. This attack is so rare to come across since there's barely any wizards in the game, and you might just not notice it if he doesn't land the confuse anyways. I straight up just didn't even notice that this was in the game until a few months ago. The final battle interaction quirk I'll put into this video has to do with all the puff type enemies. When dark, rough, and ice puffs charge up their strong weather attacks, jumping on them will deal one damage back to the attacker with no damage dealt to the puff. You can get around this on the dark and rough puffs with the electric status, which lets you jump on them like normal. But for some reason, poison puffs in particular behave a little bit differently. Instead of dealing one damage back to a jump attack, he actually deals back half the damage he would take, similar to the spite pouch or return postage effect. He even still takes damage from whatever hit him, but it will interrupt a jump combo after the first hit. I'm sure there's way more weird behaviors that enemies in this game have, so if you know about any other ones that I didn't mention, then absolutely make sure that you comment them down below. I will admit there's a few Thousand Year Door scholars that are regulars on this channel that I'm pretty much expecting to blow my mind. And now, let's move on. Let's start this segment off with probably the most easter eggy easter egg to ever munch on a carrot. The poison mushroom is obviously one of those sort of joke items that's meant to be bad and that you'd never want to actually use, but rarely, for some reason, it can provide a benefit. Normally eating it will take away half your character's health and give them the poison status, but occasionally it will fully heal the consumer instead. I believe it's around a 20% chance for this to happen, but I couldn't find a definitive source. I honestly love details like this in games because the developer definitely just added it because they thought it was funny. There's really no scenario you'd ever find yourself in where you're banking on that 1 in 5 chance to heal yourself when the other 4 times out of 5 you would be royally f***ing yourself. And on the topic of things that are royally f***ed up, Let's take a look at the Feeling Fine badge, and especially how it interacts with the Tasty Tonic item. This chart right here was created by JDAster64, who has done incredible amounts of research and documentation of this game's inner workings. Note that the Feeling Fine badge actually doesn't prevent burn or freeze from happening, which is strange because those are definitely negative effects. It also doesn't prevent slow or allergic, which are statuses barely even used in the game at all. It's also coded to not prevent the effects from Fright Masks or Gale Force, but oddly enough it is is programmed to prevent the showstopper KO effect. Enemies can't hold feeling fine, nor can they use any of these statuses, so these are just straight up unused behaviors. And curiously, Tasty Tonic does not completely overlap with feeling fine. Tasty Tonic does not cure electric, which I think makes sense because it's a positive status, but feeling fine does prevent electric? I'm really not sure what actual reason could explain that. Tasty Tonic also doesn't cure attack down, which once again feeling fine is able to prevent. Oddly enough though, Tasty Tonic does cure electric allergic even though feeling fine can't prevent that one. This bleeds into unused content again, which isn't really the point of this video, but since it's relevant and interesting, I'll still talk about it here. Enemies have a couple strange behaviors related to Tasty Tonic coded into the game that JDAster also put on this chart. Most notably, enemies are programmed to use a Tasty Tonic if they have the electric status, but it wouldn't actually heal the effect. They aren't coded to use a Tasty Tonic on the allergic status even though that one can be healed by a Tasty Tonic. Getting footage of this would require hacking the game in ways that I don't really know how to do, so we're just gonna have to take JD Aster's word for it. In the world of Thousand Year Door though, his posts might as well be the Bible. <laughs> This game absolutely adores its fake randomness, which I find to be a really interesting game design choice. You would think the best way to make something seem random is to make it you know, actually random, but a lot of seemingly randomized things in this game are predetermined in one way or another. 
The most famous example of this is the Happy Lucky Lottery, which was debunked several years ago to follow a really strange pattern. I won't go into too much detail on it here, but essentially each prize can only be won after a certain amount of real life days have passed. This actually makes the lottery significantly easier, since if it was truly 100% random, you'd have a 1 in 10,000 chance of winning first prize on any given day. Besides that, the instance of fake randomness that was most earth-shattering to me was the fact that the bingo slots that appeared during battle aren't random at all. This is something that I'm almost embarrassed to admit I only learned fairly recently from YouTube comments. In hindsight, it's pretty obvious, but when you play this game for the first time when you're 4, you kind of just accept what the game tells you and that becomes fact. There's about a 5 or 6 frame window to press A when the correct icon is on screen, but due to human reaction times and monitor latency and stuff, it's best to locate whichever icon is before the one you want and press when you see that. It's hard to be 100% consistent at it, but this will make you get bingos much more often than if you just pressed at random. You can also use this knowledge to avoid getting the poison mushroom bingos, which can completely ruin your entire fight. The advice that Cappy, another Thousand Year Door legend, likes to give is to press the button right after you see the poison mushroom fly by. This way you purposefully time the input late and have a huge window to press A and not land on it. Now you might be wondering about the other slot machine in this game, specifically the ones inside the Pianta Parlor on the west side of Rogueport. Well, big surprise, they can also be timed. This video from Arantula is a great explanation on how it works and I'll have it linked below, but in short, each icon shows for 3 frames and you can learn exactly when to press the button to land on a 7 on every single slot wheel. This is the same 3 frame timing window as a super guard so it isn't easy, but since it's possible to do super guards consistently then it's absolutely possible to do this too. Or if you play on emulator and you're a giant weenie hut junior like I am, you can just use save states and all of the challenges taken out of it but timing it yourself is definitely way cooler. One of the other fake randomness things in this game that I never really put together are all the times that x knots throw rocks at you in the audience. It feels like it happens really often compared to every other audience event in the game, especially against the Shadow Queen's first phase for some reason. Well, as it turns out, JD Aster has the answer to this too, which doesn't surprise me. x knots won't target you at random, but will instead actually target you with rocks whenever you attack an enemy but fail to damage it, or whenever you get countered by an enemy. So for example, when the Shadow Queen is invincible and you try to attack her, the x knots will judge you for being weak and dogpile you. I actually encountered another fantastic example of this in my recent No Attacking Challenge playthrough. When I was trying to kill Bowser and Kami with Showstopper over and over, the attack failed and did no damage several times in a row, and each time it failed, the x knots in my audience would try to bury me under rocks the next turn. Every. Single. Time. Funnily enough, Hammer Bros are the only other audience member that has an event triggered by a specific scenario and not just RNG. They will throw hammers at you whenever you fail a hammer attack in order to properly show you how to manhandle a hammer handle. This is probably why it seems so rare compared to every other event in the game, because realistically hammer is super easy to use, it's way worse than jump, and hammer bros aren't super common in the audience anyways. This is another point in this video where I'm sure there's more instances of fake randomness throughout the game, but I can't remember any of them off the top of my head. But hey, that's why I said I'll probably make a part 2 eventually. And finally, to round it all off, let's look at a few minor overworld quirks and even mistakes that I've noticed from playing this game for so many years. This one that I never knew about until I did my no action commands challenge playthrough has to do with the Grubba fight in chapter 3. After you break into his office and rummage through his desk, he'll take off and run to the arena. As a kid, I always just took him on right after that, but for the no action commands challenge, I wanted to go back out and restock my inventory before doing the fight. Well, apparently there are guards that block both exits, preventing you from leaving while Grubba is still at large. The game isn't incredibly strict about leaving during sequences like this otherwise, and I had never tried to leave so I never knew this was a thing. This next one is more of an oversight than an actual mistake, but it's the one that I always wondered about as a kid and I finally got a chance to test it in the recent Minimum Turns video that I did. When you fight Duplis for the second time at the end of chapter 4, you start the fight with no partner due to Vivian realizing that Mario is in fact 
Mario. After two turns of fighting by yourself, Vivian will rejoin the fray and help you take down Duplis. But what happens if you defeat Duplis before she returns? During the first round with Duplis, he's set to revive at 10 HP if you kill him before he transforms into Mario, but during the second phase, there's no failsafe like that to make the story cutscene play out. Using Mega Rush and Power Rush, it's pretty easy to kill Duplis with a single power bounce and finish him off on the first turn. Afterwards, the game behaves totally normally as if Vivian joined and helped you, and and it implies that they made up and are working together even though the last conversation they had did not really go that direction. I guess the developers never expected solo Mario to be able to kill Duplis that fast, but it's still weird that they accounted for a quick Duplis kill on the first phase, but not the second. And finally, let's end off with probably one of the most useless ones, but it's one that I found randomly while playing the game recently. In the Excess Express, there's a star piece panel in the engine room right next to the save block here. Spin jumping will flip it over and give you the star piece totally normally, but if you ride the Excess Express back from Poshley Heights and towards Rogueport, the panel will actually not be present in the engine room. This is obviously because the train is reversed and uses a different room to make this effect happen, but it's still funny that they either forgot to account for this or just figured it didn't matter that much. And so that's all I have for you today. I hope you guys had fun with this not so comprehensive list of obscure mechanics and features in Thousand Year Door. Make sure you comment down below if you know any other weird knowledge for this game and tell me what stuff you didn't know before watching this video. As always, huge shout out to the Bringle member squad for helping me make these videos happen. I can't express how incredibly motivating it is to have people willing to invest not just their money, but also their energy and passion into these videos that I'm making. And if you wanna get your name on the screen with these lovely individuals, then you can do so by hitting the join button and sacrificing a measly $3.99 every month. You'll also get early access to videos and extra behind the scenes content. And if that's not stuff you're into but you still want to support, then please make sure to subscribe because that goes a long way to helping keep this channel going. Well, that's it for today. See you guys next time.